Okay, so um, before I start, I'd like to thank Jamie and Tico for inviting me to present at this event. Um, considering I'm not from a music or a music practitioner background, it makes quite an interesting event to be surrounded by people who practice music and try and create new music. Um, hopefully what I can deliver in this presentation really is some limitations to some of the technologies that people might want to use, and more importantly, some of the limitations to the users of the technology that people might want to use. So, the, the presentation I'm going to give covers quite a broad area. It effectively covers three case studies that we have undertaken over in the DMT lab, which is based in Millennium Point in the CB faculty of BCU. And in that lab, we do lots of different work with regards to audio processing, image processing, and also mixed reality and interaction systems. And I lead the group over there that does the image processing and mixed reality interaction systems. So what I want to present to you here really are three studies that's looked at evaluating different problems that users can have when they try to interact with virtual elements or virtual objects or even virtual interfaces. So, I'll talk in three ways really about a study into manual interaction whereby you use one hand to try and manipulate virtual elements for whatever reason. I'll talk about a bimanual interaction where you use two hands to obviously manipulate a, a said object. And then I'll talk about another case study where you look at perception of people trying to visualize and, and gain some quality from that interaction. So, Part of this work really is born out of these studies that we've done over the past five or six years where we've been trying to really quantify methods for interaction and trying to develop new methods for overcoming some of the limitations. And we've published several papers on this. Uh, I can point people in the direction of those. But effectively what we're trying to do is measure quality and user interaction. And if you look in literature, what you generally find is that most performance metrics look at first person user quality and they look basically at assessing how somebody interfaces with the system and how well they can translate their interface to the, to the response. And lots of evaluation metrics look at objective or subjective quantification of this. There's very little literature on objective measurements. Most of it is done in an informal setting and a lot of it really can't allow us to then translate those results to any useful interface. This is one very good survey that covers the whole area that I'll talk about, which is done by the HIT lab in New Zealand, so the Human Interface Technology Lab in New Zealand. If you want a first place to look, I recommend starting with that generally. So, as I say, we're, we're trying to work on new methods for interaction based on user performance, and we're trying to create adaptive models that can change based on errors that users do. This then really allows you to, to develop a system that works optimally around the errors that we get. We also look at perceptual methods that try and trick viewers to, to make them believe that the interaction was better and the system is better. So, generally, and quite top level to start with, if you're looking at user task performance, it's usually gauged or measured by things like task accuracy, so how well X has performed Y, task completion time, how quickly X completed task Y, how um, accurate with regards to spatial positioning, so positioning in space that X completed task Y, or what trajectory they created, or what motion path X did when they were performing Y. These are the general sort of top level areas that you can think about if you're starting to measure task performance. When you look at perception performance, and these are the two things that I'm gonna try and review, you're aiming to measure the perceived quality of person or user when they've actually interacted with something. So what they felt about the system, what their perception of the quality of the interaction was, how they felt the interface worked with them. It can also be based on somebody observing the interaction. So not necessarily a first person, but also a third person. So for example, one of you guys may be interacting with something and I can watch it on a screen, and then my believability that you're controlling the tools or the interfaces that, that you're trying to control could also be measured. Generally, these are uh, low-level tasks. So these are, how did it make you feel? How, how did you feel in control of X? Or did Y influence that? Where our work is born out of 
as I say, is not music production based, it's interaction system based, but it is born out of trying to create realistic interactions that exist in a virtual environment for live TV broadcast. So we had a TV virtual studio, which effectively was a, a layered system that allowed virtual objects to exist or coexist in real space with a, a presenter on TV in real time, and it allowed seamless transition of those objects, but it didn't allow any interaction. So there was no interaction possible, people couldn't move objects, they couldn't rotate, they couldn't walk in front of, they couldn't do anything with those objects other than just stand near them. So this is where our work was born out of. We developed a system that could allow interaction. Trouble is, when we tried this system, users just couldn't use it. We could use it because we designed it, we knew how to use it, users couldn't use it. So we started to evaluate why they couldn't use it and measure the errors and start to quantify those errors. Problem we had, we couldn't use any wired devices, we couldn't use any gloves, we couldn't use anything connected to the, the users because in the end we had somebody viewing a system that wanted to believe people were manually manipulating those objects, they were interfacing with them and they didn't have any exterior control. So we had to, um, to use freehand interaction systems, so something that has no devices, and start to quantify the errors of these freehand systems. So one of the studies that we looked into was effectively how well people can grasp objects. So if you're trying to grasp an object, and that's what the Lego is here for, how well effectively people could literally just grasp an object. One of the most simple forms, one of the most common forms of interaction we do in manual day-to-day -day tasks. To do this, we had to pick one grasp, the one I'm trying to illustrate, which is the most common grasp, namely it's called a, a medium wrap grasp, there's taxonomies of these things. And we have to define measures to quantify the aperture of the grasp, how well people have met the size of the object with their hand, and where their position of their hand was. Because in virtual space, you have no feedback, there's no haptics, there's no tactile response for us to actually measure where this object is. We're effectively just trying to find it. And we try to work out where the problems are based on these measurements. So how we did this, we did an experimental evaluation with two experimental designs, I'll talk about them in a moment. But we had a similar setup to this in essence. We had a connect to at its optimal working range, and we had a defined working interface range around the user in front of them. So it's 40 millimeters, oh sorry, 400 millimeters by 400 millimeters by 400 millimeters, and we positioned virtual objects in this range and basically monitored how well they could grasp the problem. So this was the system, relatively general in some sense. So connect version 2, open CV to, to do some video processing, Autodesk Maya to do some modeling visualization, OpenGL to do some rendering, some real-time rendering, and uh, our own open, uh, sorry, C++ visual rendering system to do evolution handling. You can't really see this, but task one, we used 15 participants, two objects, so a cube and spherical objects, six different sizes, five repetitions. This meant each person did 60 grasps, meaning we could analyze 900 grasps in one set to try and work out from those 900 what the patterns were. I've got some videos of these, I'll try and show you the videos because they're quite interesting in essence. So, this is where users are trying to, whoops, try and put it in, let's just see if it's not like that, no, it's converted. It may be easier if I show you these videos after. But effectively, they show the videos of the setup where users are trying to actually manually grasp these videos. What we found, these, these objects, what we found was there's commonalities. Commonalities across the displacement that users have when they try and grab objects. Effectively, the regions, so these clusters are on 900 grasps 
for our 15 users correlated together in the regions. And there's problems with regards to the object size and structure. We went further, we looked into position and moving the object in space, created 810 different grasps from the different users in different positions. Again, I've got videos I can show you after if you wish to see these, illustrating the, the grasps. And we found that actually there was a, a recognised working range from this area that we worked in that was notably down in this bottom corner here. And, and there was more discrepancy when users tried to recreate graphs that were up to the top right. We used right-handed users, so it gives you an indication of dominant hand position. So this area showed some similarity or correlation between users. So we went on from that and we started to evaluate if you've got these patterns across users when they're just doing a grasp, what patterns do you have when they're doing a, a bi-manual interaction, so when they're trying to grab an object and move it around. First test was a static object, when they're moving them around. So we created a similar setup again. Three modalities, how they can match an animation of a moving object, how they can interact with a moving object, or how they can just mime an interaction. We created some metrics to perform the actual measurement of this. Top one is, is how close their hands are away from the object. Bottom one is how much they vary when they interact. Do people vary their hands? And a whole host of different conditions to measure. Size, target speed, axis of placement, whether they're holding an object at the sides or at the top, the direction they're interacting, their, their hand position, whether they're moving an object up or down, etc. Again, I've got some videos I can show after uh, if you're interested in this. And this showed that actually there was lots of trends between users. Users did overestimate size of objects, but they also underestimated size of objects. Some interesting things in the fact that speed had no significant effect in any results. So if you made a very fast moving animation or a slow animation, it didn't really seem to change the errors that were introduced. But most commonly, we found that placement was a problem. So in this setup, placement and location of the object was a problem, similar again to what we found with the grasps. So we then stepped back from this and thought, right, how intrusive are these problems? If you're trying to view this, if you're trying to observe the interaction, how intrusive is this? And there's lots of literature explaining that viewers have a different perception of quality than the interactors. So a third person has a different scale of gauging the quality. And we designed a lot of them perceptual tests based on recommendations, based on recommendations from communication systems on how to do these perceptual tests. And I'll jump because I've only got a couple of minutes. What we did basically is using a standard environment for testing viewer response, we simulated the errors. I'll jump to here. We simulated the errors that we found from the previous tests. So we created synthetic replications people interacting with objects, with the error estimations, I'm not sure you can see this, but with gaps between their hands and the objects, with the, the problems we found in the first tests, and we looked at how people ranked these, how they rated them, what, what were the most problematic errors. We used a standard scale, I'll jump to this, right through from very annoying through to imperceptible, and we got then some perceptual trends for what people were tolerant of with regards to these errors. So whether they found this gap on this scale very annoying, or whether they found if I put my hands inside the virtual object, whether it, it was imperceptible. And actually this did show some interesting things, and I've got some videos to show this later if you wish. But it actually found that viewers were very tolerant to adaptations of objects. So we, we changed the object to match some of these errors and presented these to users, and they were really tolerant of that. They didn't notice objects were changing when people were trying to interact with them. So they didn't notice if I had a gap, for example, between my hand and the object. It grew. They were accepting of that. It, they were almost blind to it in some respects. They also responded positively to people underestimating size. So if I put my hands inside an object, they thought it was okay. If it was outside, they didn't like it. So it gave us some rules, really, to kind of start to design interaction systems and say these offer the best quality. 
what we're doing now then is obviously applying all these rules, trying to develop new interaction methods that use these manual and bimanual findings that basically give you these discrepancies to work along, alongside. So we're trying to work out interaction guidelines for space, models to adapt towards what we've found, and basically we're trying to create an improved quality for users in the interaction. I've had to jump through quite a few things there, I'm afraid, but if you want more information on this, we've got a few publications on this. Um, we um, also have more information on our DOT Lab website. I can offer some of more information if you email me, but I can also answer <laughs> questions. I mean, I can show the videos later if that's, um, if that's clearer as well, because some of these videos are quite interesting. We run these tests, particularly the perception tests, um, using a whole range of different people, and, and it was quite interesting to know what you can get away with in, in quality when you can change object properties. We've still got a lot more to explore with regards to some of the initial tests that we've done with Raspbit, but once you can understand some of the problems, effectively we can try and improve the interactions as well, right? Only well, because you didn't mention it um, in your kit list at the beginning, have you seen the, the Max MSP external the leap motion detector, which gives you some very nice um, data on, on finger movements? Yeah, um, I haven't, but I have some experience with the leap motion, and due to the range and the problems with the leap motion, it wasn't a kind of suitable solution for what we were aiming to do here. We needed almost like a, not just a freehand, but it's great for small interactions and freehand. But we, we needed something that could work at a range of around about two meters. Mm -hmm. So something that really captured, although we're not using the full body, the, at least the upper body. Um, and while the Connect 2 may not offer the fidelity and finger movements that something like the Leap Motion may offer, it, it gave us the points to be able to measure the discrepancies that you get with a, with a regular grasp. And, and for us, that discrepancy was the thing that we were more interested in. However, it would be interesting to try the leap motion, but we also would like to try physical wearable devices on, on the objects as well to correlate these results. Um, my colleague, my taste, did a lot of work. She's sat over there with the leap motion, so she can answer some questions about that as well. Yeah? Oh, there I go. Um, it was very really interesting, thank you. And uh, I was kind of curious to know um, which kind of object you realize within the visual environment and uh, if you change the object itself, mm -hmm. does uh, your lessons are still valid to be grasps and all the changes are still valid using a different visual objects or Yeah, this is, this is is a fundamental question because like you say, translation of results, when you've done some tests in one, one sense, you want to be able to translate it. In the first example, we tried to cover that in the sense that we, yeah. we, we used cubic objects, which I can represent in Lego, and we also used, used spherical objects, which kind of covers the, the translation in two different potential areas. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to do spherical objects with Lego. Yeah. Um, so, so we did try and cover it in this case. In the second experiment, we just looked at a cubic object, or in this case, it was actually a, you know, just a, a square object. Um, that said, here was an interesting finding in the sense that users always reported to us after tests, they thought the spherical object when grasping was far easier. The objective results are far worse for the spherical object. So for this grasp type, in these environments, under this condition, the actual results are better for cubic objects than they would be for the spherical objects, but people felt that they were performing better on that. Now, we haven't tried it with the interaction sense in different shaped objects, but... And uh, the participants, were they aware of, about the shape of the object before you grasp it, or... And in this case, did you notice any differences between in the kind of gesture and interaction with, with the object if, if 
there were never any more if it was actually a water sphere. Yeah, there was one thing I should mention is there was two things found from this. It's this is a really key point. There's two things found from this. We found that um, one thing really is quite common is people have a, a, an almost common aperture to their hand when they try and grasp an object. And joking aside, it's about pint glass size, whether that reads into our subjects or not, but they were quite a wide demographic. So irrespective, we measured hand size, arm length, we measured all the parameters of people. They generally operated in, a, in a, an expected grasp size for around about this. The, the results were in our paper. Now, that didn't change with different objects, but what did change is the way they did the grasp. Yeah. So this came apparent, this very apparent when they were supposed to be doing that. Okay. Yeah. This very apparent, this, this, yeah. this, all manner. So the, the range of what they did with one control grasp. And, and getting back to your first point, we trained them on real objects first, so they knew what yeah. grasp to do. We trained them on virtual objects first, so they know what grasp to do. And the variance was still alarming. So that's a problem when you're designing interaction systems in the sense there was some commonality, but still, this is what you've got to consider as well. Thank you. We're out of time, so uh, thank you.